of us hold treasured memories of growing up with or raising kids who gleaned invaluable life lessons from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, a beloved TV show that graced screens nationwide for over 30 years. But there's more to Mr. Rogers than just his trademark cardigan sweaters. The formula behind the show is considered a proven blueprint for raising happier, healthier kids. Our guests today, Greg Bear and Ryan Rudzeski, have masterfully penned When You Wonder, You're Learning, exploring how Rogers nurtured the tools for learning now deemed essential for school, work, and life. Welcome to Parenting Great Kids. I'm so excited to talk to these two gentlemen and the wonderful impact that they're having in the education of our kids. Let me kick things off with a quick introduction. Greg Bear is not just a father, but a passionate children's advocate whose efforts to spark children's curiosity, foster creativity, and promote a sense of belonging have garnered global acclaim. On the other side, we have Ryan Rudzetsky, a father, former teacher, and an award-winning science and education journalist. His storytelling expertise spans a wide spectrum, ranging from schools to space travel to the iconic Mr. Rogers neighborhood. Gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on today and talking with me about kids and education. Dr. Meeker, thank you. We feel lucky to be in your neighborhood today. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I love the idea of just being in a neighborhood. It just makes you feel warm, doesn't it? You know, we're, we're here together talking and we have our little micro uh, neighborhood. Now, we've witnessed a Mr. Rogers renaissance um, with a documentary I was asking you about earlier, um, the movie starring Tom Hanks. Uh, how does your book when you wonder your learning fit into this Mr. Rogers Renaissance resurgence. Sure. So as you mentioned, there is an amazing documentary. Tom Hanks uh, played Fred in the movie, uh, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Oh, I'm sorry. Tom Hanks played Fred in A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And Maxwell King's biography, um, The Good Neighbor, all came out around the same time. So we've had Fred come roaring back into the culture. And what all of those pieces of work have to do, they're so, all sort of about Fred Rogers, the man, this sort of larger than life figure who looms so large in our childhoods, mm -hmm. right? And Fred creates a certain feeling in all of us. You think back to when Fred walks through that famous <laughs> front door, we all feel calm, right? We start to feel safe. We start to feel accepted. Our book is a little bit different in that we dig into the how. Mm -hmm. How did Fred Rogers create those feelings? How did he do that for so many people from so many different walks of life for so many years in a row? His impact is astounding. And what we found in the course of our research is that for, there was nothing magic about Fred. You know, his wife, Joanne Rogers, always used to remind people that he wasn't a saint. He had a careful method. He had a careful intention. He had science behind everything he did. And that's what, what when you wonder, your learning digs into. I love it because he absolutely did create a sense of warmth and calm. I can hear his voice. I can see him walking through that door. And even talking with you, it just makes you feel, oh, this is so great. Why has... Um, interest in that feeling come back or that that method of teaching is it no, just nostalgia is it from a sense that we have missed out on something what what is driving that it's probably a little bit of all of that right there's no doubt that we feel an emotional connection so many of us had a chance to watch mr rogers neighborhood maybe alongside a sibling maybe with a mom in a living room S generations of Americans have an emotional connection. And as we look out at our society, we're longing for that sense of neighborhoods and neighborliness and kindness. And there's no doubt that we see in a fractured political system, in uh, you know challenging economic conditions, as cities and rural areas go through all sorts of undulations, toward this rapidly changing social and technological era to which we're heading, there is something calling us to say, what is it that we can do? What does it mean for us to be human in these times? 
and create the sort of humanity and conditions that we want for ourselves and we want for the kids in our care and whom we're raising. Mm -hmm. You know, you're absolutely right. And it feels like the world feels like the polar opposite of his neighborhood. There's chaos versus calm. There's order versus um, confusion. And that's what I love about your book is you, you highlight what people want and how they think without even knowing it. So how did your idea for the book come to fruition? Simple enough, right? So Ryan and I have an opportunity to work in the field of education. Ryan's a former teacher. We've worked in the field of education for almost a quarter century, uh, each of us. And, and in the course of working and supporting teachers in schools, but also museums and libraries and other places where caring adults are supporting kids, we also found ourselves reading journal articles from wickedly smart learning scientists at places like Carnegie Mellon University or the University of Pittsburgh right here in our own backyard or MIT and Stanford. We're like, what is it that makes great learning work? Mm -hmm. And as we were reading these papers by learning scientists, more and more they were reading to us like scripts from the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And we thought, well, that's weird. Like here are these incredibly yeah. wickedly smart scientists with all sorts of quantitative and qualitative analysis and it's as if they're writing scripts that might have appeared in the neighborhood decades ago. Wow. And we started wondering, is there a different story to tell about Fred Rogers? Not just the emotional one that so many of us feel and sense, not just the, the sense of kind neighborless, neighborliness, but actually Fred, the deliberate and intentional scientist who maybe was decades ahead of his time in terms of what, what works in learning and maybe has blueprints for us that matter in the years 2024 and beyond. And lo and behold, Fred matters more than ever. Yeah. Isn't that remarkable? <clears throat> because you're absolutely right. Some of the, the, the most impactful behaviors and thoughts and ideas that you see captured in these you know, articles and journals are really very simple. And I think that was, to me, the beauty of what he did and what he created is he seems to have taken sort of some complex ideas and made them so, so simple. Can you um, share some examples of um, um, how Fred Rogers integrated the science into the fabric of his show? Sure. So I can tell you in the neighborhood really started with listening, which is interesting because television, of course, is mostly a one way medium. We heard Fred. He couldn't hear us in response. But I'll tell you, one of the most amazing moments we had while researching this book is we went to the Fred Rogers Archives, which is a totally unassuming room on the campus of St. Vincent College in Latrobe, Pennsylvania, which is a, a little town just east of Pittsburgh. It's actually where Fred was born. Mm. And if you walk into the archive, it's just a room full of boxes, right? It's fluorescent lighting. You would never think it was anything special. But in those boxes are 50 years worth of correspondence to Fred starting in the late 1950s, all the way up until Fred's death in the early 2000s. So if any of your listeners ever wrote a letter to Mr. Rogers, they can probably go find that letter in the archive. Hmm. And what's amazing is that Fred responded to every single letter he received. Wow. At the peak of his career, he was responding to 50 or 100 letters every single day. Oh my! And you can see what kids are sharing with Fred. And they are just as exciting and interesting and heartbreaking as you might imagine, right? Mr. Rogers, you know, my parents split up. Mr. Rogers, I'm sick. Mr. Rogers, my dog died, that sort of thing. And you can see Fred's notations in the margins, and he's thinking about how he might respond to this specific child. And over time, you can almost start to draw through lines between what children are sharing with Fred and what he's talking about in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood. And that's when we really realized that the neighborhood very much was a conversation. Fred was responding directly to the fears and the hopes and the joys that children were bringing to him. And he was doing it in ways that kids found accessible and welcoming and safe. You know, I was just listening to um, an episode that you did with Andrew Peterson, the uh, singer-songwriter, mm -hmm. and he said that art is at its best when it's an act of love. Yeah. And really, the neighborhood was an act of love. It was Fred responding and telling kids that all the big feelings, the anxieties, the concerns, and the hopes they're bringing to him, all of that is okay. There's a place for you in the neighborhood, too. And we know now from science that that sense of uh, unconditional acceptance, mm -hmm. that sense of belonging for every child, is more than just a good feeling, 
when kids feel that, they are more likely to learn. Uh, they are healthier menti- mentally. They're even healthier physically. It, the ripple effects of knowing that somebody likes us just the way we are um, are kind of astounding. And Ryan's example from the archives signals something that's so obvious and yet so fundamentally important, and that is relationships, right? Of course, there are many ingredients that contribute to the atmosphere that allow kids to learn in wonderful, creative, curious ways. And having a caring adult alongside them who's loving what they do is core to that. And when I think to all of those letters in the archives, so many of us felt like we were in relationship with Fred Rogers. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely because he thought of that screen as holy ground. And he thought about one little buckaroo, as he used to say, that was on the other side of that screen and thought in in deliberate and intentional ways, even through this seemingly cold medium, I can create relationships that are central to the other things that I'm aiming to accomplish. It's foundational. And the learning science tells us repeatedly, hitting us over the head now, the importance of those caring relationships in kids' lives. You know, you're absolutely right, and yet we're 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 pretty poor at it. When I when I think about it, uh, the way everybody knows they need to connect, they know they need better relationships, but it feels like we're going in the opposite direction. So what I'm hearing you say is that the what the first tool in creating a healthier environment, a healthier relationship for your child is is listening. Why are we not good listeners? I think we, and when I say we, I mean parents, I mean educators, we're under a lot of pressure to do just about anything but listen to one another. I'll give you a very specific example. Greg mentioned I'm a former teacher. Uh, After I left the classroom, I became an educator coach, which means my job was to drive from school to school across all different school districts. And I was observing other new teachers and giving them feedback and helping them sort of find their legs in the classroom. And all the schools I went to, they more or less looked the same, right? They were all built in the same era, the same sort of 50s, 60s architecture. They had the same level of resources. They had the same mix of new and experienced teachers. But there was one school that was different. And I could not put my finger on why it was different. Because when you walked in, you just felt good. And it wasn't anything I could point to. Something was different. And finally, I asked the principal. I said, look, this is going to sound crazy, but I need you to explain to me What's different about this place? Because I can't pinpoint it, and so many kids could benefit. Clearly, your students are. And she laughed, because right away, she knew what I was talking about. And she said, what we do differently is, for the first two weeks of every school year, we don't teach any content. All we do is build relationships with our students. Now, they had very intentional ways of going about doing that. They weren't just sort of sitting around chatting for two weeks. But she said, every year I get flack from my school board, I get flack from other principals and from my superintendent because they want us to jump straight into testing. She was under all this pressure to do anything but listen to the students in her building. But she said, you know what? Every year we take this two weeks. And every year we outperform all the other people who are telling us not to do it. And it was that moment I realized it was just an encapsulation of relationships often seem like a nice to have, right? They often seem like once we get the real work done, then we can talk about relationships. Mm -hmm. But what Fred was always reminding us is that relationships are the work. Without them, nothing else can happen. And so I think we need to give ourselves permission as parents, as teachers, as adults to do that listening, to resist the pressure to do other things until we've done that listening. Because if we don't do that listening, we're not going to go anywhere. Listening can feel intimidating to parents um, because parents sometimes don't want to hear what they think their kids are going to have to say. Um, And it, it requires work. It requires a discipline. Listening to a child, even a, a teenage child, a five-year-old t- child, takes discipline because it means you have to shut out everything else in your mind if you're really going to listen. And from my standpoint, I'm kind of a professional listener because I've been p- practicing pediatrics for over 30 years and I've just listened to thousands of kids and their parents and, you know, problem solving. And I love it personally. It's, in- it's fascinating. It's, it's much more fascinating to listen than it is to tell them something. But often I would think parents 
are under the same pressure a teacher is, and they feel that, well, I only have 15 minutes with my child. It must become a teachable moment. Therefore, I need to say something. I need to influence this child's life to get him to become successful. But what you're saying is that really doesn't build a relationship. Relationship is the foundation for every uh, interaction and success, I don't mean financial success, whatever a child is going to have in their in their lives. You also talk about the tools, the other tools, curiosity, creativity, uh, and collaboration. Talk about how we nurture the curiosity and the creativity in children of all ages. Yeah, so it's, a, it's so important when we think, for example, about curiosity, that kids know that it's okay to, and it's good to wonder and to ask. This is maybe best explained by another example. Hedda Sherapin, who worked with Fred Rogers, beginning on you know the initial production in the 1960s, continuing for decades, relayed this example to me and Ryan of walking into a classroom because she was there to watch a master teacher do her thing, right? Like this is, this is a special moment. And she walks in and she sees this wicker basket. You know, classrooms are crowded. It, there was this large empty wicker basket thinking like, well, this is weird. Like this is taking up space, but you know, Hedda goes to the back of the classroom. And in fact, she watches great teaching unfold in this classroom space. Now sometimes, and these kids, importantly, they're asking questions. Like, so that's good, right? Now, sometimes these questions are right on point with the instructional plans that the teacher has in mind for that day. And of course, in that moment, pedagogically, she's taking the moment to respond to that question. But more often than not, these kids are asking questions that are coming right out from over the left field wall, right? Like they just, <laughs> oh, yeah. they're, you know, they're like crazy questions. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a reminder that kids bring them their full selves, Right? Like they bring their full selves. They're not just like vessels that you open up and pour things into. They're bringing everything that's happened to them, their experiences, things on the mind into that setting. The wonderful thing about that teacher is that she was taking the moment to notice the question, to acknowledge it, to physically write it down on a piece of paper, and then putting it in that wicker basket and saying, later together, we're going to wonder about the answer or answers to your questions. Mm -hmm. Now, Dr. Meeker, there are all sorts of small tactical things happening in that moment that are adding up to an atmosphere that encourages creativity. There's the sense of psychological safety. Like this is a place where it's okay to ask questions, no matter what my question might be, that there's a caring adult in this space that's gonna help me figure out the thing that's on my mind, right? Like these things are so important to the atmosphere, whether it's how we greet kids at the door, the exit that we um, provide to them when they leave our presence, Sometimes just being present to them and listening as we were just talking a moment ago or doing things that physically demonstrate to kids that it's okay. It's good to wonder and to ask. Mm -hmm. And that ask it basket example illustrates that in, in the most beautiful ways. And that's something that, you know, parents can have on their dining room table and ask it basket at home for the little kids that they're with or their grandkids. It's uh, all these little moments that show children again that their big feelings, their big questions, it's all okay. I'm going to put one on my table for my grandkids, the ask it basket. I love it. <laughs> but I was thinking you need two because in order for a parent to to pay attention to the question and to answer or, or to have the kids answer the question, you answer the question, it means you need to put other things aside, i.e. your mm -hmm. phone. Yes. Because you, you cannot concentrate and really pay attention to a child of any age if you have your phone in your hand. And it's interesting to me because I have more kids complain about their parents' phone use than I do parents complain about their kids' phone use. Because kids know if you're distracted and you're not paying any attention, you pretend you're paying attention, texting on your phone. Yeah, I'm listening. I'm listening. Give me your give me your question. They're not going to give you the question because you're really not paying attention. And a lot of what you're saying sort of flies in the face of modern education where we're we're just trying to get kids lined up with information and more information and more information and there really isn't that great sense of human interaction. That's a fabulous example of how we uh, develop a stronger relationship. We, we encourage kids to express themselves, be creative, um, and to ask those questions. 
Can you give us a few more examples of simple things that parents of younger kids, as well as parents of teenagers, that they can do to capture their child's attention, but also to discipline themselves to give their attention to their child? I love that you brought up the phone because we actually cite a study in the book from the University of Washington. This is one of the longest longitudinal studies of children ever conducted. So it was back in the early 1980s that researchers took a group of children, they divided them into two groups. So group one, these kids and their parents actually got an intervention that helped them build stronger relationships. The other group, group two, was the control group. There was no intervention. And then the researchers followed these kids for 40 years. The researchers released the results in 2019. And what they found was that in group one, this group where parents and teachers had helped building stronger relationships, these kids were healthy, more healthy physically. They were making more money. They were far less likely to ever be incarcerated. They were even more likely to vote. Any metric you could pick Mm -hmm. in terms of successful children, these kids were exceeding their peers. And this held true across race, class, gender, you name it. And what the researchers boiled down 40 years of work to was this. I'll just read you the direct quote. The most important thing we learned is to provide opportunities for kids to have positive social involvement. Make sure your kids have the opportunity to engage with you as a parent. Play with them. Hold them. Don't just sit on your phone when you're with them. When kids feel bonded to you, they're less likely to violate your expectations and you're likely to be setting them up for longer lives long into the future. That's 40 years worth of science distilled Mm -hmm. into two sentences. And what you mentioned about putting the phone away is really about being present. The most important thing we can do is be there for our kids. We're not always going to be there perfectly. We're not always going to be there 100%. But I think part of the reason we still feel so bonded to Fred is because He was there for us every day for almost 40 years. And not only that, he was there for us in the same way. He walked into the room the same way. He ended our visit the same way. And he always promised us, hey, I'll see you again tomorrow or I'll see you again after the weekend. We knew we could count on a caring adult. And the more kids know that they can count on a caring adult, even an adult who's imperfect, the more likely they are to succeed on all those measures, you know, income, health, civic engagement, you name it. Yeah. It's remarkably simple, but remarkably hard for parents to do because, and I'm not trying to put down or malign any parent because any parent listening to this podcast is trying really hard to be a great parent. And I believe they are because they're they're in the right spot. They're trying to learn, but there's so much working against parents right now. Uh, They're being told from so many sources, particularly in the internet, that in order to be a good parent, they need to buy a certain kind of diaper. They need to feel uh, start feeding their kids kale from the time they're two months old. They need to buy the right stroller, right school, everything. And then also they have the, the phone and, and addiction. And I think parents are just busting at the seams and, and they want this kind of simplicity. I really believe they do because they understand what you're saying and resonate with it. But I think there's this sense that they may feel that I don't know that I can really get there. Will you speak to that parent who says, this is a great idea, but being really present for my child is, I I just don't know how to do that. And I don't know how to work it into my busy day. Well, when we talk about Fred Rogers, one of the things that Joanne Rogers, his wife, told us um, and reminded us and, and said to us, you know, don't present Fred as a saint, right? Fred was not a saint. Fred was a human being. He got mad. He got angry. He went through all of the same human emotional things that we all do. And no one worked harder at being Fred Rogers, she said, than Fred Rogers himself. So remind folks of that. And and so I can hear Joanne saying that to me and and me saying it to you and, and to the listeners right now. It's a reminder that Fred and his work is accessible if we're deliberate and intentional. Now, that's hard. Very hard. We have a colleague, we have a colleague, Jun Lei Lee, who's at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, whose work really now is focused on, on helping parents understand that you're enough. Yeah. Right? It's that sense of being present. Amen. Like above yeah. all else, if you can be present and you can listen, that matters. And if you can take it one step farther, modeling behavior, right? Lean into the things that bring you joy, right? That, that's not a bad thing to do. 
you know, if you love baking or you love getting on your score skateboard, or if you're going to pull out your old guitar, pull it out, Mm -hmm. right? Like be playful, but do the things that you love because as Fred Rogers reminded us, the best teacher in the world is the one that loves what he or she does and loves it right in front of you. If you can do those types of things with your kids, you're going to contribute to the atmosphere in which you want to be raising your kids themselves, and they're going to be more connected and want to be in your presence. It's, it, it, it's, it is simple, but you know what? It's, it's actual rocket science. It's, it's hard work it is. to do well, and we just need to be ever more deliberate and intentional. The hardest things to do in life are the simplest, and, um, but they're the most rewarding and the best. So I'm hearing you say, in here's this parenting program, and we're talking to parents about how to be better parents. You're not giving parents a list of things to do. Essentially, what you're saying is peel a lot of stuff off and be with your child, play with your child, um, simplify life. Because what we've been talking about, again, is, is hard, but it's very, very simple. And I love that. That should be so refreshing to parents out there who feel overwhelmed that they need to do and provide uh, for their kids. I love that you mentioned Joanne Rogers. How else, how did she influence Fred's work and um, not just his life, but the work that he was doing? Well, I had the privilege of knowing Joanne, oh, the last 20, 25 years of her life. When Mrs. Rogers gave you a hug, you just felt like you were on top of the world. I, um, it is just so clear that theirs was a partnership. And we saw that reflected after Mr. Rogers passing, uh, the way in which she was really careful about preserving and advancing his legacy, Mm -hmm. right? She was so proud of her husband and the work that they did. And I I think uh, when I, look, I I wasn't there in the household. Mm -hmm. Um, And I imagine that everything that they did was a partnership which also is a reminder about Mr. Rogers' neighborhood itself, Mm -hmm. right? Because yes, it was Fred, but it was also David Newell, and it was Hedda Sherapin, and it was all of those folks at WQD. There really was a genuine team of people, including Margaret McFarland, who was a remarkable psychiatrist at the University of Pittsburgh who became Mr. Rogers' lifelong mentor and dear friend. There's no doubt that in his work, Fred leaned in on the learning scientists in his own neighborhood, the pediatricians, the teachers in his lives, and his own family uh, as a real source of support for the work that he was privileged to do. And one other thing we should say about Joanne is that, uh, you know, we, Greg and I have had the pleasure of talking to parents and talking to teachers all over the country, all over the world since this book came out and, and hearing about the impact that Fred had on them. But the greatest honor of this whole journey is actually having uh, a foreword in the book written by Joanne Rogers. Now, as far as we know, this is the last public facing thing Joanne wrote before she passed away. It is, um, in our opinion, it is the best part of the book. We want your listeners to read the whole book. But like if you only read one part, it's (laughs) a it's a it's a wonderful piece of writing. And and it drives home the fact that um, that partnership that Greg mentioned. She was such an incredible steward of Fred's legacy. And she reminds us that, you know, all of us can do a version of what Fred did. That doesn't mean we copy what Fred did, but all of us can create the sort of atmosphere that Fred created for us. We can all create those feelings of warmth and safety and acceptance for ourselves and for the people around us and for the kids that we care for. And Dr. Meeker, you've heard us use the word atmosphere a few times. Mm -hmm. This actually comes from Fred himself because a journalist one time was asking him about Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and what is it that you're doing with this television program? And he described it. He said, I'm creating an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what you and I and other parents and grandparents and and those who are entrusted to care for kids can do. I mean, that's essentially what we're talking about today. Mm -hmm. Not to copy Fred, but in our own way, in Greg's own way, in Ryan's own way, in Dr. Meeker's own way to create that atmosphere. And yes, there are elements to that about being present and about listening, but there are tactical things we can do like that ask it basket or, mm-hmm. or creating a maker space in our house or, or doing Saturday experiments and, and, and really inviting some you know, curiosity and whimsy into our lives. There are, and we try and capture some examples in our book uh, of the simple things 
that we can all do, but also the systemic things that schools and museums and libraries and other sites of learning that are present in the lives of kids and caring adults can do to create that atmosphere in our cities and our rural areas and all across this great country. I was going to ask you, uh, who was your target audience when you were writing it? But your target audience is enormous because you're, <laughs> you're, you're talking to parents and grandparents and teachers aunts and uncles, anybody who really is passionate about kids. Um, and, and that's what I love about it. So you've been working in the educational space. When you go to schools and you're talking with teachers or principals, um, what, are the, what are the three things that you want them to know and learn and put into practice after you leave? I can tell you, uh, you know, we might actually have different answers to this, Greg. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it'd be great. Go ahead, Ryan. So uh, for me, the number one thing that I like to leave audiences with when we speak to them is, um, you know, we ask people, what's the most memorable way someone has ever shown you how much they care about you? And the stories that we hear, the things that people share are, are absolutely beautiful. And we do this little exercise that Fred himself used to do which calls us to you know, think of the people who cared for us, the people who wanted what was best in life for us, and then think about how is it that we can follow their example and make goodness attractive, as Fred himself used to say. He used to say the toughest assignment you'll ever be given is to make goodness attractive. Mm -hmm. Now, we all have people in our own lives who are proof that making goodness attractive is possible, right? Maybe it's a parent if you were lucky. Maybe it was a teacher or a friend. For many people, maybe it was even Fred Rogers himself. I mean, a lot of those letters that I mentioned earlier are not just from kids. Fred got letters from adults. He got lots of letters from folks in nursing homes, mm. people just thanking Fred for being a presence, a caring presence in their lives. And so if we leave people with anything, I want people to leave knowing that they have the power to be that Fred-like person in the lives of the people around them. They might not recognize it. They might not even be familiar with Fred Rogers, but all of us have something that's worth giving. Mm -hmm. And I hope that what we do when we talk to folks, and I hope that what we do in the book for readers is give folks um, both a prompting to look for that thing, but also space to think about it and, and some inspiration to consider how they might act on, on whatever it is that that strength is and, and um, make the world better for themselves and for their neighbors. And you mean the strength inside of them if they're looking? Inside of themselves. Okay. Because okay. as a parent, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, now what can I do um, the next time my grandkids come over to make them feel warm and accepted and... Um, so a parent or a teacher would find um, the goodness that they can bring to that child that's going to help them to listen and help them want to learn and be curious and to create that atmosphere, correct? Because sometimes it can seem a bit elusive for parents. Um, I know it was second nature to him, but um, so that's specifically what you're talking about, right? Sure. And we give all sorts of examples in the book of how people are doing this in their own lives and how you might adapt those examples for your own kids, for your own situations. But I think the core, what Fred was always telling us was be more like yourself. And so we have to think as adults about what are the things that light us up? Who are the people that light us up? How can we love those things and love those people and love them in front of our children? Love it. Yep. Thank you. So Dr. Meeker, uh, I, I do think it's important to note it, it 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 only became obvious to us that it was second nature to Fred because of how deliberate and how intentional he was. The really important and interesting part of Fred's story is that when he was enrolled at the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary and started volunteering and working and studying at Arsenal Family and Children's Center, that he met folks like Margaret McFarland, but also Benjamin Spock, the doctor who wrote Baby in Child Care, we met Eric Erickson. Wow. You know, folks like pediatrician Brazelton and others were coming through. So he learned from all of these pediatricians and psychologists and psychiatrists, and he applied it in the most seamless ways possible to lyrics and puppetry and poetry in a way that we didn't notice as viewers and that we as adults can now go back and look at and to say, how did he do that? How is he deliberate and intentional? If I may return quickly to that question, because I, sure. I loved that you, you asked Ryan 
uh, about three things. And I, I have a similar but different set of three things. One, we hope that whether it's teachers or early childhood educators or judges or nurses or whomever with whom we have the privilege of connecting, that they really do have that sense that they are enough, as Jun Lai Li has articulated so beautifully in his work, right? There's in the caring professions, folks attend so carefully to their craft to try and do ever better to serve their students, their patients, whomever it is that they're um, given the privilege of supporting and serving. And that's really important to know that they're enough. Two, I feel like real change happens in lots of little bets. And so we talk often about little Fred bets, little Fred bets things you can do, like that ask it basket, mm -hmm. like bringing that guitar that you love into your classroom setting and how you integrate it with your math lesson, how you might use um, you know, a Halloween costume Hulk mitt to welcome the kids into their classroom and, and what that projects and makes them feel in the sense of welcoming and belonging, like all sorts of little things that we can do. And we've, we've identified hundreds of examples from great educators and others from across this country. And the third thing is to talk about love, right? We, we somehow shy away from talking about love in public settings. I think a lot of us struggle in very private settings to talk about love. But it, love is, is at the root of everything, as Fred said. And it's important that for those of us in the caring professions, whether it's a, a, you know, a group of first grade teachers or the librarians who've gotten together, to really talk about how are, we, how are we loving our students and their families? And in what ways are we demonstrating that? And how are they feeling about that? And, and talking about that out loud so that we give a real language and specificity to what we mean I love. I love it. <laughs> no, you're absolutely <laughs> right. Yeah. We only, I have one final question for each of you, and I love saving the best for last. Uh, so I want to talk about Greg and Ryan now. In writing the book and in knowing Joanne Rogers and Fred Rogers, how have each of you been changed personally? Mm. You want me to share first, Ryan? Sure, sure, go ahead. So co-authoring a book like this, as I was lucky enough to do with Ryan, it, you're right, it becomes personally challenging. You know, for, for me and my wife raising our daughters, for me, the person aiming to support educators and others, it's, um, it's prompted me to slow down in ways that are really important, and profound, and try and be deliberate and intentional. I'll, I'll give you a real life example that occurred shortly after, or maybe even shortly before this book was published. And, and it was a Friday night. I was exhausted, right? Like it was during the NCAA March Madness tournament. I wanted nothing more than to simultaneously watch five college basketball games, <laughs> yeah, right? right? I was exhausted. And I'm sitting there in my living room and my daughter is resting next to me with her head on the side of the sofa. And, and she turned to me, Dr. Meeker, and said, Daddy, am I going to be shot? Hmm. Which for me came out of left field. Yeah. Now, sadly, I suspect there are a lot of your listeners and, and families who've heard that question maybe even multiple times. For me, that moment was the first time that I'd ever heard that. And and that's a scary moment because I felt anxiety. I didn't even know how to respond. And in that moment, Dr. Meeker, it was as if all of the lessons of co-authoring this book came back to me. Mm -hmm. One, you know, let your, let your girl know that she's safe, right? Acknowledge her question. Don't ignore it. Let her know that you actually don't have the answers to her question. Acknowledge that it's a little scary, that it's even scary to me, and that together we're going to figure and sort things out together. I feel like I've had so many moments like that, whether it's profound, like I just described, or the little moments when, you know, you're hurried and, tr and trying to get breakfast and get to the bus stop, right? Like I've had so many moments in, in my life where the lessons of Fred have come back to me to say, how might I be ever more deliberate and intentional in what it, in the atmosphere I'm trying to, you know, create for myself and for my kids together with my wife. And look, I, I mess up a lot. I fail a lot. Oh, yeah. I get angry. I get mad. I am far from the person I want to be. But it gives me a blueprint for, for what I might do and how I might do it. My guests have been Greg Bear and Ryan Ritzuski. The book is When You Wonder, 
your learning. Mr. Rogers Enduring Lessons for Raising Creative, Curious, Caring Kids. This has been a wonderful and eye-opening discussion about something that we think we already know, but we may not, and that takes a lot of work, but it's the good work and the deep work and the great work. So gentlemen, thank you for joining me and thank you for writing this wonderful, wonderful book. Thank you so much, Dr. Meeker. It's been such a pleasure to be here. We're just, we're so grateful for you and for your listeners and for all the people across this country who are taking care of Fred's, you know, each and following in Fred's footsteps, each in their own way. Trying, trying, trying. Yeah, yeah, thank you.